good, 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 uh, good afternoon to you all. I'm really happy that we are back here uh, with the BNC studio visit. Uh, and I said this is going to be a real live studio visit. So uh, thank you so, so much, Marcus Lyon, for having accepted to open your studio and Julia Campbell Carter uh, for this idea of this studio visit, the, the one of the first. So you, uh, Julia, you're an uh, independent art advisor and curator. You're working and living in London. You help people build their collection that goes from modern contemporary art, photography, but also modern and impressionist art. And you gave lectures as well as art as an investment for, for private clients at uh, HSBC and uh, Union Investment. Uh, you have launched your own online viewing room presenting artists like Grégoire Hildebrandt that I really liked and I've shown and I have a, a piece of him actually and Christian Hall. Uh, so you had this idea to organize this real uh, studio visit with Marcus and Marcus is in London and he's actually uh, outdoor now. Uh, but first, before Marcus uh, will, uh, will, will talk, uh, I will leave uh, Julia for uh, an introduction and then, uh, and then Marcus, and then I'm going to mute you all and you can, as you know, ask, wait, wait for questions and answers at the end of the talk. So your time, uh, Julia. Thank you, Anne-Pierre. Thank you so much for introducing me and hello to everybody and thank you for joining us today to the studio visit despite the glorious weather outside, us being glued in front of uh, our laptops or computers, but I promise you it's worth it. I met Marcus many years ago at Paris Photo and fell hopelessly in love with him. I was introduced to him by a renowned a gallerist from Cologne called Thomas Sander. He's a very known uh, gallerist. And um, Marcus is exhibited globally and internationally at um, uh, collections as the Smithsonian, the Museum of Modern Art um, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, the Art Institute of Chicago, the VNA, and uh, the Arts Council Collection of Great Britain. Um, his, you will see, uh, he worked his early years, he worked for Amnesty International in Latin America and the effects of globalization are a huge stimulus for him in his works. You will recognize that and he will talk about that. Um, he, is, um, he gave regularly TED Talks. His recent TED Talk was a, a TED Talk about photography and identity. Um, about a thousand people attending. He's an excellent speaker and he's a very meticulous man and he is a committed social entrepreneur. So I now hand you over to Marcus. I will in a while ask him a few questions and I would love you to ask him a few questions too. Very good. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm here in uh, Kennington Oval in the shadow of the gin factory that Beefeater distill in, London's last gin factory. And at the end of my street here, the iconic oval gas holder by the cricket ground. So now we're gonna enter my studio by the front door. The glassworks here has been the site of my work and my home for over 30 years and I'm absolutely delighted to bring you in. We regularly have events here but this is my first ever virtual event. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set you up here on a tripod and talk to you a little bit about my early career. So this building, the Glassworks, is uh, the store actually, the old store for the gin factory where they used to store juniper berries and citrus zest. And in terms of the, um, uh, the space, what we've done here is create a studio where I've worked for 30 years. Now my early career was spent mostly 
building the studio and the facilities working commercially. But as I developed my practice, I spent more and more time doing pro bono work, working with disadvantaged children. I spent a lot of time working with Amnesty International, various other social enterprises that were helping people in great need. That was obviously fabulous soul food, but I obviously needed commercial activity. So I created a lot of portraits. I took a lot of commissions all over the world. But as I was entering my mid-career, I'd done a vast amount of different things, but I really wanted to start communicating on a higher level about the way we lived, our globalization. And I began to work on a project called BRICS. Now, BRICS, as you all know, stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And the BRIC images explored the mega cities of the BRIC economies. Now, you'll see, because we, I think, have successfully shared our screen here, an image I took in Rio de Janeiro. And this body of work was exhibited at the Saatchi Gallery and really was the beginning of a whole new period of life for me as an artist. Um, the pictures were extremely detailed, very emotional representations of the mega cities of the developing world. As I'm sure many of you know, the urban population of the world was about a million in 1960. And today it's somewhere in the region of 3 billion. And then by 2030, they reckon it'll be 5 billion. So what you're looking at is the movement of 4 billion people into the urban spaces of our cities. So my contention with the work was that this was the most important change space in our societies, places where there were huge opportunities and there were huge uh, changes afoot. So those images really gave me the opportunity to communicate on a greater level about the world we live in and the way we live. Now, in many ways, uh, the BRIC series was about um, rural urban migration. And in terms of that migration story, the work allowed me to start exploring ideas about migration and that led me to my Exodus series. Now, the Exodus series was, I suppose, even bigger in vision. And what I was trying to do was create the opportunity to talk about all the migrations in our society. And in this room at the back of my studio, you can see a series of the migration pictures, the, the Exodus series. Now, Exodus was exhibited all over the world, saw a great deal of success. The, uh, the images are collected at the Smithsonian Institute. And what we've got is a series of images that look at the great migrations of our time. So this image here is uh, the container port outside Hong Kong. And I've uh, taken some images from 1,500 feet in the air, hanging out of a helicopter shooting straight down into the container port. And I've taken a series of images and then I built them all together and created an image that I think looks a little bit like a stained glass window. I'm wanting these images to start having some ambiguity to allow people to dream in them and see other things. And so in a sense, it is a representation of the new religion of consumerism, of the movement of little objects all around the world to um, whet our appetite and to, to satisfy our desire to communicate. This image is from the same series and looks at the movement of goods and product across the surface of the world. Now, in terms of um, the Exodus series, we created uh, a series of nine images in it and they create a whole exhibition in themselves because these are very large, very substantial two meter images that cross uh, a, br a broad uh, brush stroke of different subjects. So here you see the final one we're gonna show you on the, the screen share, which is the one I took in Houston, Texas. Now, this one is called Liberty Road and shows an incredible railway junction, which is just outside downtown Houston. And 
um, I suppose in a sense explores the idea of migration as an organic structure. I always feel this looks like a blossoming flower or some form of incredible multi-tentacled octopus. And yet it is our, our, a representation of our insatiable appetite to consume. So once I'd started um, moving into these, these large format um, uh, artworks, I wanted to, to take to the next level. And the next level I think was moving into uh, looking at uh, this next project, which you see some of them behind me, uh, set vertical here, because as uh, aerial images, they work very well, both vertically and horizontally. Um, so this project was called Time Out, and this looked at what the billion of us do, who are, um, we found shelter, we found sustenance, we found safety, so what do we now do? And so the images looked at our recreative, our recreational activities. So this image here is uh, LAX Airport um, and is a representation of LAX as a spine with ribs. What I'm really looking at here is the organic nature of the objects we create, these huge civil engineering projects. Now, in terms of um, the America pro the, the project, it was all shot in America. So this next one is uh, Marina del Rey. And here again, I was looking at that uh, um, dichotomy between the reality of what we see from high up looking down at our earth, but also the other patterns and shapes in our world. So this one, I think we were playing with the idea of computer chips, of a, of a computer chipboard even though it actually is a yacht basin on, on just uh, north of Los Angeles. And finally, here's a more playful one we did of some water parks uh, outside of Houston, Texas. And what we were doing with this project here was looking at the play space that we all, all enjoy so much. Now, that is a good 10 minute pricey of the work I do in terms of global mass behaviors. But I also spend a lot of the time collaborating and working in my studio with fabulous people who create opportunities for me to communicate on other levels. Now, here behind me, hanging in this lovely window space, is an image from my optogenome series. Now, optogenome was uh, a body of work that I created in collaboration with the uh, Medical Research Council scientists at the King's College campus at Guy's Hospital and with a group of AstraZeneca's top infectious disease scientists. Um, I'm sure they're very busy right now. And what we did, Joe, I think we'll share a screen here that allows you to see one of them. This is called How Do Chemicals Feel? And what we would doing with the body of work was exploring ideas around what relationships scientists have with our emotional life. So we were looking at the space where scientists create amazing things uh, and we think of them as kind of slightly Frankenstein-esque mad professors and yet actually underneath it all they're deeply sensitive and um, exceptionally creative people. So this one recently sold at Sotheby's and is, I think, one of my personal favorites of the work I've done in this collaborative space. This image here explores the DNA journey. Um, I'm sure, as many of you know, very famous photograph, perhaps the most famous photograph of all is called Photo 51, which is an X-ray crystallography image taken by, the, by Rosalind Franklin. And she was the first person to photographically visualize the double helix of DNA. And photo 51 simply recorded the fact that she'd done 50 experiments before the 51st, which is where she successfully created the uh, ability to understand uh, the double helix form. And this is a picture of 50 separate lab benches representing the 50 journeys on the lab bench that one takes to get to a place where one can actually truly discover. So it, it, it explored the, the science creation space. Now behind me here, we have an image of my, let's adjust the camera, there we go. This is an image from my Rombert series. Now Rombert, as I'm sure many, many of you 
um, know are um, probably Britain's top contemporary dance troupe. And what we're looking at here is an image of the uh, stage taken from above. And what I've done is I've shot a whole series, a myriad of different images from up in the light rig, up in the gods, shooting down on the stage. And I've shot images of simply every aspect of the dance and then montage them all together to create a very, very, very detailed representation of the whole dance piece. This image here is now Three Dancers, which is a famous dance piece that Ron Baird do, which explores the space um, around a Picasso, a classic Picasso um, image. And I think at this stage, that's a really good place to hand over to some questions and some uh, representation of some time for, for Julia and Anne Pierre and you guys to ask me some questions. Mention when you do the Rambert, just briefly, that you have a very philanthropic touch because you give some uh, money oh, yes. to. Yes, could you please mention that yes, as well? Yes. Um, I actually I know quite a lot of the dancers at Rambert, and it was an idea that we built to try and fund new dance pieces. So what happens is 50% of the net proceeds of every sale of a Rombert picture goes back into their new work commissioning fund. So mm -hmm. by uh, creating the images, it was a wonderful collaboration. It was a fascinating process. I love working with dancers. It's just brilliant. But I think over the last five or six years, we've generated somewhere in the region of 35,000 pounds towards producing a new work of dance. So. Uh, I'm very proud of that. And it's a slightly disruptive model in terms of the arts creating value for, for itself. Um, another question I'd like to ask is, or another is, what inspired you actually to become a photographer in the first place? I think there are many influences, but I think the, the simple thing was that I was probably quite um, a lonely little boy. And I lived in the, uh, in, I was a country boy. And um, I think when I first got given a camera, it was the first moment that I felt I had a voice and that I could say something that people might want to listen to, that people would engage with. So I suppose for me, um, it, was, it was like finding a best friend, but it was also like, like finding my voice. Can you tell us a little bit about your early days of photography, when you started? Not when you were a little boy, but sort of the beginning of your career, please. So, uh, in reality, um, I actually uh, studied political science at university, and that um, uh, allowed me to perhaps have a more analytical approach to photography. Having uh, spent uh, a few years sweeping floors in various art studios in London, I went on a, a long trip to the US and I covered uh, uh, 22,000 miles across the US, practicing my art, taking photographs every day, discovering how I wanted to, to, to communicate. And this particular image is very important. This sits in my studio. Um, and I know you like this one particularly, Julia. This is uh, the mission building. And I shot this when I was um, uh, probably about 23. And I put it into one of the big European photo competitions. And um, I, at that time, I, I was actually traveling in the States on a budget of $15 a day, which obviously that sounds like no money at all now. I mean, it wasn't very much back then, but it certainly was enough to... For, to feed me and fuel my vehicle. And um, this image won the big prize. So I won the gold award for this image and um, that uh, changed my career in many ways. I went from the photographer who used to ring people up for commissions and say, I've got a portfolio, Will you? can I come and see you? Would you give me you know, a chance to tell you my story? And people would go, oh, ring me back in four months to I won that award for that mission building picture and suddenly it was like, oh, Marcus Lyon, yeah, we know your work. Would you like to come in and see us this afternoon? So 
I still hang that picture in my studio and it helps me remember, you know, humble beginnings and it helps me remember that, you know, you need great friends and, and people to support you and you need a little bit of luck every now and again to make things happen. Mm. Um, Marcus, could you uh, talk a little bit about your Human Atlas project in Brazil, Germany and Detroit briefly? Yes, I mean, with my early beginnings in uh, social sciences, pol political science, the collaborations I'd had over many years with um, uh, social entrepreneurs, w uh, enterprises working with disadvantaged children, all that work really made me realize that they were deeper stories to tell. And in my, um, I suppose in, in about 2010, I began searching for a big portrait project and I created a, a very, very deep, I suppose anthropological uh, project called Human Atlas. And the Human Atlas projects explore groups of remarkable people. So we build, uh, a nomination process that goes in search of a hundred remarkable people in a certain jurisdiction. So the first project, the first human atlas was in Brazil. And we went and photographed a hundred remarkable Brazilians. We recorded their personal testimony to high quality sound. And we also analyzed their ancestral DNA. And then we mapped this all together into a book and an exhibition format, which has gone across the, the world. So Somos Brazil, We Are Brazil, which is a series of portraits, DNA maps, and image-activated app-based soundscapes. It's traveled to Australia, to China, across Europe. It's been in Britain, and of course, it exhibited in, 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 in Brazil and America. And again, some of these are, are in the uh, permanent collection at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. That project led us on to We Deutschland, where we explored a group of 50 remarkable people in Germany who were working on issues to do with migration and diversity. Uh, this was, as with Somos Brazil, a fully funded project, which ended up in a limited edition book, all collectible, all available through my studio. And this is uh, one of the portraits of a lady who was born um, abroad, but ended up in uh, as a German citizen. I think if I'm right, and Julia, you might correct me as a native German, but I think nowadays Germany has 20% of Germany's population has a significant migration story. Uh, and that meant mm. that this particular project was both amazing to photograph, we met amazing people, but very, very, very relevant to the world we live in today. And then right now we are uh, literally printing as we speak uh, our third iteration of my Human Atlas projects. And this is I Detroit. And I Detroit explores the social change agents of the city of Detroit. We spent the last three years studying, researching, finding the right hundred people, then bringing them together through images, DNA maps, and uh, image activated app based soundtracks. Um, this is the amazing Tiffany Brown, who is, uh, works for, a, uh, has set up an organization called. 400 forward, which is to find the next 400 African-American female architects, because up until now, there have only ever been 400 female black architects in the United States. And she's gone in going in search of the next 400 to train them and, and create them. Um, Marcus, so that's excuse, what we're working on right now. Excuse me to inter interrupt. Who decides for these 100 people or 50 people? Who is a gremium or who's who? who we, um, who decides who you're going to photograph? We, we create very resilient nomination processes. So we spend six months reaching out to community leaders, grassroots leaders, journalists, politicians, people who work at the front line. And we ask them to nominate individuals in their communities who are making the difference. Uh, uh, Marcus, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Before uh, Julia has a, a question, I can see that we have, uh, we have uh, uh, already some questions here uh, from uh, some uh, of our members. Uh, so maybe, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the technique and this one uh, is uh, on more the technical aspects. So you will have a conversation about it. It's about uh, Alexandra, do you want to ask your question? Or, um, yes. 
you hear me? Yes, yes I'm here. Uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, more about uh, for, for, for my, uh, the first part of your work. Uh, uh, why, uh, what is the parti pris of uh, uh, looking, uh, of high done looking on all the first projects uh, you showed? And how do you uh, define the right distance now? Because I, it was very interesting to me that uh, your high done looking uh, project went from uh, geographical, which seems quite logical, up to uh, dancing. So, so the, the question is how do I choose the locations of the images in the global? Uh, for, for, why is this parti pris of this uh, done up uh, looking on all the series? Uh, what, you know, uh, and second, yes, how do you? decide or, or get oh. to the right distance? I mean, as with all of the work that I undertake, there's a huge amount of research. So I think the, first, I think the, que the question is answered like this, um, but it's, if it's not, do tell me, uh, please. So the first part of the process is I do a little sketch. So I start imagining things in my head, shapes and patterns, and I do little pencil sketches, and then I begin to build that with Google Earth and research around the world to find the location. And then when I found a location I think has some of the elements of what I want, I then uh, contact uh, people. So for instance, this one of LAX, I would contact a helicopter pilot and I would get permission to go to, um, uh, 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 to be above the airport. And then I would take multiple images of the airport and then I come back to the studio and then I recreate it. So this particular image you're looking at here is actually uh, a montage of a thousand separate images all brought together. So each of these images take me somewhere in the region of three months to make in total. Uh, Did that help? Yes, yeah, so it's first a mental uh, create a construction and then you go and find the reality to work on this mental construction. Exactly, yes. I mean, one of my guiding principles right since I was very small was the idea of pre-visualization. That actually, a, a bit like anything in life, if you, if you think about what you want to do or where you want to go, you're more likely to get to the place you want to go. Um, and if it's not quite the right place, it's probably nearer to the right place than you would have got if you just don't think about it at all. So I'm not into aesthetics on their own. I'm actually into the idea being the king, and the idea leads the visual representation of the information I want to talk to you about. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely spot on, you've got it. I did make sense for once, thank you. Uh, Ma Marcus, uh, how, how do you, uh, uh, how do you, uh, what, are, what are your sources of inspiration for, for uh, you know, how do you find your subjects? Oh. I mean, in terms of the globalization images, I mean, it's very much thematic. It's around certain themes. Um, today with the Human Atlas projects, I'm very fascinated by extraordinary human beings. So the work I'm doing there leads me, uh, the, the people who are creating this amazing work in their spaces and in their communities, they really sort of attract me. They're like magnets and I find them and then I want to study them and interview them and do their DNA tests and take their portraits. In the collaborative work, um, you know, I suppose, again, it's very personal. Um, you know, in the, the medical side, uh, just tying up a theme we began earlier, I said I was quite an isolated little a child. Well, one of the reasons that was the case, uh, amongst others, was I was, um, sadly, I lost my elder brother when I was little. And he was very medicalized. He'd been quite poorly. He had a genetic condition. So he spent a lot of time in hospitals, which means as the, the younger brother to him, I spent a lot of time in hospitals and around doctors. And so exploring with the optogenome images, exploring science and uh, the science of cure was obviously fascinating to me, having experienced such an early loss. In terms of the dance, you know, I was very much led to that because dance is the only form of um, performance where I feel I have no um, language to narrate it with. I have to let myself go on another level to be totally emotionally immersed in dance and I find that very inspiring and very releasing. 
So I'd always been fascinated by dance and that led me to meet dancers and know dancers. And then we began to dig around the idea of producing work that explored dance in a different way visually, that told a deeper story. I mean, I think the, the, the kind of the line that cuts through all this work is this desire to communicate on the next level, to try to endeavor to tell a more powerful story about the world we live in, how we self-author our lives and how we co-author a more hopeful and fascinating future. And uh, Marcus, oh. yeah, sorry, I have one more question. And and uh, uh, what about the the photographers that or artists that you uh, really like and uh, you admire and uh, you know? Uh, uh, of of course, uh, of course, we think of Andreas Gursky, but uh, but uh, but also it's very different. So uh, um, uh, is it the the idea you want to? Are you? Uh, are you uh, attracted by the idea and the meaning and then you provide the form or is it more uh, because you seem to have like three themes? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you I, mean, I, I think I think it's I, I wouldn't want to pick any particular influence because I'm not sure I've got a photographic influence. I mean, I'm a great early in my early career. I was a great fan of Ansel Adams and his technical abilities. That helped me be a very technical photographer and be very, you can see from my work, it's incredibly de detailed and precise and his, his process was something I learned a lot from. Um, I'm a huge fan of Sebastião Salgado, the Brazilian reportage photographer. I love the fact that you look at any of his work and you realize this man has gone to the ends of the earth to create the most beautiful pieces of uh, reportage imagery. I mean, I think he, He's a god of, of photography. Um, as a portrait artist, I'm a great fan of uh, Abaddon's and I'm a great fan of Jane Baum. Jane Baum, the, the newspaper photographer, famous for her Gentle Eye book, which was definitely an inspiration for me when I was young to want to create portraits. Um, today, I suppose I'm more interested in uh, art where people are bringing together multiple voices. So with the work I'm doing with Human Atlas, you know, I'm bringing in DNA mapping, I'm bringing in sound and the technology to, to, to mount an app with sound. So you swipe the portrait and the portrait talks back to you. So I'm looking at, I suppose, multimedia platforms, but I'm also looking at trying to use modern technology to enhance the emotional connection to my work. So I'm, I'm perhaps more fascinated by artists like uh, the sound producer Brian Eno or um, the, the sound uh, illustrator Martin Ware. So I'm looking at artists who are using sound and DNA and other, other things to, to bring them together to tell, to tell this bigger story, this bigger truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Julia, do you have, we have one last question, but Julia, it's, uh, yes, maybe you... Uh, yeah. This is not something I, this is something which is very spontaneous. Um, you were just mentioning your little, your story about your older brother and then the story about the doctors and labs and chemicals. Could you go into this one artwork that you were just mentioning with all the little chemical pots and what you did to the scientists and what, they, what the tops of, the, um, of each pot says? Okay, you know well, what I'm hopefully, yeah. hopefully we might be able to share the screen of that one and then that will become clear to our participants. But mm -hmm. the basic idea behind um, the image, it's called Everybody Has a Compound. And I ended up shooting images of every one of, I don't know, about 500 compounds that were uh, in little bottles, in little compound bottles that were in the infectious disease laboratories of uh, a research um, science space in Waltham, Massachusetts. And each, here we are, there we go. So each one mm -hmm. of those compounds is effectively potentially a lifesaver, might be a COVID-19 lifesaver, I don't know. <laughs> and what we did is we, we rebuilt every single compound into this grid, this huge grid, and then I, in, invited every one of the top scientists that I was working and collaborating with to write a single sentence of their emotional connection to research. And then 
written across, which you can't see at this size, but if you have the picture or you're close to the picture, you can see it written on all the bottle tops are the sentences that they gave me. So what we're doing here is we're bringing together the uh, intellectual uh, IP, the intellectual uh, property of that particular science laboratory with the emotional uh, intelligence of the scientists who work there. So what we're doing is we're creating this layered effect of, of bringing more light to the space of science discovery and cure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just give us one sentence. Just give us one sentence of a, a, a scientist. What did they, what well, did they say? Um, it's not in front of me, so I'm going to have to use my memory. I, I, I think one of my favorites is something like, even saving one life would be worth my life's work. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. I thought this is just in our current climate, something uh, that's very appealing, yeah. you know. Um, very resonant. Mm. And uh, Marcus, what is the future of photography in your view? Um, well, for me, it's about more of more and an, an ever increasing uh, push to bring uh, other technologies and other ways of communicating to an image to give people better stories, more powerful stories. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the thing I love about photography mo the most is that it is the storytelling medium of our time. But gone are the days where we just have a photo and a caption. And we now need to find ways of using new technologies and new communication uh, processes to tell deeper truths about how we co-author, how we, how we make a better future. So I think I covered it a little earlier, but I think it's about collaboration and it's about finding new, new visions of how the photograph can talk to, to our hearts. Uh, now, uh, Marcus, I have another question from Benedict. Uh, Great. Uh, I'm going to unmute Benedict if she hears me. Hi, Benedict. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this talk. It's very interesting. I've got just uh, two questions. How do you choose your commissions and what are your new projects uh, coming? Great. What? Good. Choose, choosing the commissions is a really interesting one because, you know, I suppose each, each one of the projects I'm doing now, um, <coughs> probably for the last 15, 20 years, they're kind of two, three, four year commitments. So the Brazil one was particularly uh, resonant for me because I have two Brazilian children. So um, my wife is a Brazilian and, and exploring the country of my growing family was very much at the heart of that human atlas. The German one was very much a direct commission. Somebody came to me and said, will you do a human atlas? We've got funding of a European country. And I felt at the time uh, which was two years ago, that the most interesting country in Europe was Germany because it was on this huge migrant um, process. It was, it was bringing in this hugely diverse population. Um, the Detroit one was a fabulous story. I've always wanted to do a project in Detroit. In fact, I pitched one, um, oh gosh, um, almost 20 years ago. And then the Kresge Foundation, who are massive um, foundation born, born out of the Kmart empire, they do inner city regeneration work. And they rang me up and said, would you build a human atlas of the change agents of Detroit? So they came looking for me. And then the, to segue perfectly to your second question, um, the next project is we have just started literally a month ago, uh, the next human atlas project, which is a human atlas of Silicon Valley which is called Decode It. And what we're looking to do is map and track and build a picture of the change agents of Silicon Valley. So not just the tech entrepreneurs, but the people who've been in the Valley for years, the people who are dealing with the social issues that are manifest in that area right now. So um, that's super exciting. And we've got a museum show at the Institute of Contemporary Art in San Jose booked in for 2022. Obviously, there, there are some challenges around the way we work at the moment, but we feel very confident. We've got half a million US dollars worth of funding in from the Packard Foundation, which is a big foundation that was born out of the Hewlett Packard empire. And um, so the funding's in, uh, we've got the appetite to do it, so we'll make it happen. Yeah. How many, 
Sorry, how many people in your team? Uh, so we've got, um, wait a sec, here we go. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> who's been the technology behind getting the screen sharing because there is no way as a 55 year old man I could do the technology of showing you pictures and talk in a coherent way to you. Uh, it was as much as I could to carry the camera around. Um, so there's Joe, who's basically my right-hand man. He's, he's the, the guy who makes it all happen. Um, and then there's Camilla, who's my uh, producer. She's a Brazilian. And she searches and does the research element and then helps us uh, locate people and does all the logistics and administration around the projects. And then, of course, uh, like every artist, I've got you know, I've got printers, I've got framers, I've got book designers, I've got uh, people who do the DNA mapping, I've got mapping graphic designers. And then, of course, I've got a whole series of people who are sort of supporters and, um, uh, 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 and, and um, oh, how can I put it? They're, they're my cheerleaders, like Julia and like Anne Pierre, who allow me a stage to be able to present the work because without people like that who are getting me in front of people, it doesn't happen because I don't do that. I just get on with the work. I'm stuck in my studio creating work. So, you know, I, there's a whole raft of people. I mean, in reality, the, the credit list in the back of my books at the moment are running to 250 names. So I, I'm the lucky guy who gets the name on the spine. But the reality is that it's a massive effort of people and communities and institutions that support me. So uh, I'm a very, a, a very lucky man and B, I'm a very grateful man. Yeah, because it seems to be a great, sort of a very important production. I mean, if when you are above the airport to be able to picture each terminal and then at the end, what you want is a square that looks like chips, you know, so you have this fascination of uh, technology that you want to, to use the real nature, but it's, I, it, for, for, for me, that seems to be a bit, crazy how you, you know, the technical, the, the, the behind the scene thing. I mean, in many ways on that global mass behavior work, the, the real key is the helicopter pilot. I mean, in a sense, that person is the real hero because they've got to get me just in the right position and then they've got to twist the helicopter a bit so I can shoot straight down. And I mean, obviously I, I put on my safety harness. So if I fall out, I'll just dangle 10, <laughs> 10 feet below the helicopter. But that's never happened, thank God. But because we always take the doors off, so I get a completely clear view of what I'm shooting. But the helicopter pilots, I mean, some days I go up, I can spend a whole day in a helicopter and not get very good pictures because the pilot can't get me where I want him to, to put the helicopter. And then other days you can go up for half an hour and get an enormous amount of work. So they're often the real heroes, the, the unsung heroes of the piece. <laughs> Marcus, um, do you by any chance have this photograph of Heathrow from um, the ground, from looking into, oh, yeah. the, into the sky? Can, can we see this? Or is this... Um... Yeah, Joe's going to get it up right now. He's just looking for it. It's the London plane images. So this, yes, this, one, because... this one's a kind of different one. I've kind of turned the, the Exodus uh, uh, format on its head. And what we've got is we're actually, instead of looking straight down at the earth, we're looking straight up at the world above us. So this is an image which I think will resonate with many of us who live in London right now, um, because it shows a world that we used to know and that we don't really see so often. So I'm just waiting for Joe to share the screen. I'm sure it's gonna come, here we go. So this one is called London Plane Trails and this image explored that uh, space where you know we've all migrated it's part of the the exodus series we've all migrated to little uh, carbon fiber tubes in in the sky um it's a very popular image and um yeah it, it's isn't sort of it, different isn't it three hours three hours from the looking Two into hours. the sky Two hours. Two hours. Actually, yeah. it wasn't shot it wasn't shot at Heathrow it was shot here in Kennington above the building I'm sitting in and I just sat on the roof one day for two hours and I recorded all the contra trails as they came into London and across London and across Britain. And then I put them all together in this composition. Mm. Uh -huh. 
Um, I would love to see. Uh, I would love to see a detail of uh, the f the first theory when you know uh, 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 for the the, the 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 well the building that they look like a cathedral, but uh, you know you see it. Yeah. For us, can it's quite can you, a a of, um, <laughs> can you scan into one of the brick images, perhaps the, the, the Sao Paulo one? Mm -hmm. Joe's just going to scan into one of the Sao Paulo ones. Oh, good. Oh, Dominic Lassaud is on this call. Yes. Dominic, you know she owns two of my pictures. Oh, Dominic. <laughs> wait, wait. I'm unmuting you. Dominic, uh -huh. hi. hi. Hi, Mark. I was, think, I was thinking you? about you, you just last week. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. How, how, yeah. how are the pictures? Do they so, look good? What for? <laughs> because I was, I was doing some collation of my um, editions, and I remembered that you bought two of my pictures. I was looking at the register of who bought my pictures recently. Exactly, and uh, we love, you know, the, the photo of the sky, which just uh, so, I think it's incredible. So, uh, and it's in the, my husband's office because he works in aviation, and it's so <laughs> strong and powerful. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you I remember so we met with, through Sophie. We met, yeah, Sophie we met yeah. in that Somerset mm -hmm. house, and then we were, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were at your exhibition, it was a wonderful show. Yeah, I, re I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, exactly. Uh, so we are a big fan. <laughs> I have another question uh, uh, from Cécile. Where is Cécile? Uh, wait just a minute. I'm looking for Cécile. Uh, I can see Sophie. Cécile, here you are. Yes, go ahead. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Thank you so much, Marcus, for, for this wonderful uh, <laughs> uh, tour. Uh, my question was, you, you obviously use uh, multimedia for all your human atlas, and I wanted to know how do you best communicate the remarkability of these people via photography? Right, that's a really, really good question. Um, <laughs> fabulous. So, um, one of the great joys of being a portrait photographer when you get to a point where you're confident of your process. So you don't feel like you're taking something from somebody. You feel like you're in a very equitable relationship with someone. Is that when somebody chooses to allow you to photograph them, it's this enormous gift. And when somebody gives you a gift, you feel warm and empowered and loved and uh, connected. And so when I'm doing my portraits nowadays, because I've researched these people to such uh, great detail, I know their story so well before I meet them and I, I photograph them, I end up feeling deeply connected with them. So uh, through the photography, that allows me to get, I think, uh, just to that next level in the portraits of telling their story with their face and their body shape and their movement and how they look in a more powerful way. But when you add that uh, to the image activated app, so each one of these portraits um, will activate through an app which is bespokely made for each pro uh, project, for each book, for each exhibition you swipe that portrait and that person will talk to you and tell you their story. So we've done a long 20 to 30 minute, 40 minute interviews, and then we brought their interview down. Can I have the screen again, Joe? Uh, we brought the um, interview down to um, about two to three minutes. And so for each of these portraits in this book here, when you've got your telephone, you take it and you swipe the person. My name is Maria de Lourdes da Silva. I was born right here. And she then tells you her story. So what you're doing is you're creating a relationship between the person and the portrait, the, the viewer and the portrait. And in doing that, it takes it to another level. 
so that the images and the project ends up being incredibly emotionally resonant because you end up feeling like you know the people. It's not just a portrait that's coldly presented to you for you to judge. You're actually in a relationship with the portrait. And then of course, on the next level, what you end up having is you've got the DNA map, which allows you as an intellectual judge, as a, an audience with a mind to unravel the human story, the journey, the migration behind the person, behind their story, back into their family and where they're from and what their origins are. So in a sense with the Human Atlas project, even though it's actually quite technical, the Human Atlases, and they're quite, um, uh, they're like an onion, they've got many layers. When you're actually witnessing them, they're very simple. It's like meeting someone, listening to them, and then trying to understand their story. So actually they, they, they use modern technology to tell uh, our stories in this really resonant way that allows us to build friendships, to, to understand each other on a deeper level. Yeah, I did, did that answer your question? Yeah, and, and perhaps if I can ask, do you see a sort of commonality in these people when you look at them? Is there something that is common that makes them remarkable? Oh, that's again, that's an amazing question. I mean, I'll try and be kind of, try and keep it tight. I mean, all the people are nominated for being remarkable. So there's a commonality in their... Uh, their way they're engaging with society and trying to make a difference. So that's great. But what I love about it is when you meet them, everybody's so fabulously unique, so unique. Um, but what I have found recently is that there's, 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 there are some themes that come back again and again. And often, which is really fascinating for me, is that you do meet people who early adversity in life, early adversity that they uh, manage to get over often produces people who end up being very determined to make a difference in society. So I do find this, this theme coming back again and again when you interview people and you, they tell you their real story and they dig deep into their past and then they tell you what's really happened in their lives, not just their CV story, but their real story. You end up finding that often people have, have uh, overcome adversity and that has allowed them to uh, shower love on the people around them because they somehow have found this kind of winning formula um, they've not been beaten they they uh, um, overcome uh, uh, these difficult situations so I do I do find themes like that but in general people are really unique and that's one of the great joys of doing this human atlas work is you explore people in, in so many different ways. Thank you. That, thank, you. That's, that, thank you so much, uh, Marcus. That was a, a fascinate, fascinating uh, presentation. It's, a, it's, a, it's huge productions, what you, what, what you do, uh, and uh, in, in, in such an important scale. And uh, we are very uh, happy that you were able to open the doors of your studio today. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we uh, hope that uh, uh, you know you, we, we will be able to come for real very soon. <laughs> very good. If you could, if you could say to your participants, if any of them would like to yes. share their address with you, send me a list, and uh, Joe and I will package up at, at my studio's expense and send a, a series of images of, of the, uh, a small portfolio of the things we do, so people can have copies of them. Anyone who sends an address, we'll package it up and send it in the next week or two. Okay, great, fantastic, great fantastic. Idea. And uh, uh, so yeah, then, then we will uh, we would uh, be able to see all the details <laughs> in hand. Yes. These, these are just these are little cards, but you'll uh -huh. see the details. The, the actual pictures are two meters across. Yes. Oh, oh my God. And, the, the, the museum editions is even bigger. Uh, they are then. The museum editions, I think, are more like two and a half meters. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah. Huge scale, they were saying. Uh, the, the, the ones I'll send are that size. Yes, that's, yeah, that's, uh, and, uh, and thank you again, Julia, for this idea of a very original idea of a studio visit. And uh, it's been really well prepared. I have lots of thanks in the chat box. Uh, but everything <laughs> has been recorded, so you will find it on the, our website and also 
I will send the link of everything so you can re-listen and go more deeper uh, into the into the presentation. And uh, and also Marcus was uh, willing to share his presentation for every every one of you, those uh, of you who are interested by. Uh, uh, learning more and of course I'm here and Julia will be very happy to 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 be there to liaise so thank you so much it was fantastic we love to travel via you know the technology and makes this possible and uh, and waiting for to 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 meet you very soon <laughs> thank you for giving us the opportunity thank and you so much for listening <laughs> Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.